We need to be looking at our own company practices and policies, our cultures, to say, how can we be better? How can we be more welcoming? Hey, welcome to Solar for All, a podcast focused on the intersection of clean energy and the issues of race, class, justice, and equity. I'm your host, Jeff Greenfield, and uh, please remember that the show notes and other great resources can be found at www.solarforall.show, and that's solarforall.show. With me today is our guest, Amanda Bybee. Amanda is the CEO of Amicus O&M Cooperative, and uh, she's been in solar since 2002, which in solar years is about 100 years in solar. Uh, I've known Amanda for many years, and uh, let's see, I think I first met you when you were at Namaste, and uh, now uh, it's great to work with you at the Amicus uh, O&M Cooperative. Um, Likewise. Yeah. So uh, do we get to tell the story about our our uh, Blue Man Group escapades on your birthday? Uh, when when uh, someone's birthday lines up with a Solar Power International, uh, fun things can happen. That was a great way to celebrate. <laughs> so the subject here is equity and inclusion. We could probably interview you all day, every day about operations and maintenance and that evolving and growing sector. Um, but I'd like to focus on. Uh, equity and inclusion, and and how did you end up doing work here, and uh, why is that important to you, Amanda? You know, I first got into solar because I saw it as such an opportunity to address the climate crisis. And you know, back in the early aughts, we there was a period of time where we weren't even supposed to use the word climate change or global warming because it was too political, and. I was working at a nonprofit organization and we started the solar Austin campaign and, and we were like, that's crazy. We need to be able to talk about this. And it's, you know, having watched that whole debate evolve to where now it's not just climate change, right? It's the climate crisis. And I think that's the more appropriate way to describe what's going on so that we bring a sense of urgency to it. But what I always really loved about solar was that it, it had this promise of being a democratic solution, little d, that individuals could do something. Putting solar panels on our houses is the most tangible form in some regards of of how we can take our own individual actions to address these things. But it also held all this promise as an opportunity for jobs and for wealth building and for for all these additional aspects that it wasn't just purely about the environment, but it had the potential to also transform people's lives. And I think having watched the industry evolve over the last uh, apparently hundred years, um, which ages me unnecessarily, Jeff, easy there, but having watched it evolve, I think it's, it's quite clear that the industry has in some respects just failed to, to, fulfill that promise in some regards. And that when we think about both employment of, of women and people of color, we are not up to par with where we should be. And when we think about deployment into the communities, you know, the, the vast majority of solar deployed today is in white communities. And I, I think when you look at the, the, polls. It's not for lack of interest, you know, and I do think there's other barriers that, that need to be addressed in order to help us deploy solar more effectively outside of just the white neighborhoods, um, through more creative financing mechanisms and working with the financial, uh, entities that underwrite loans and such, but that can be done. It's just, it's merely a matter of will. And so I just feel like there's so much more opportunity for us to do better and to be, uh, to take the lead on this and really ensuring that we are creating an inclusive economy. And that we, when we talk about the green collar economy, it's not just for white people. So that's really, really important to me. And I feel like, you know, just like a lot of the rest of the world after George Floyd's murder last summer, it, it hit a nerve. It's something, it sparked Mm -hmm. something, Mm -hmm. I still don't fully understand why George Floyd was the one. Why not Trayvon Martin? Why not 
Sandra Bland? Why not any of the other hundreds, hundreds of, of crazy, senseless murders? Why this one was, was the spark, but I'm grateful that it was. And so rather than trying to sit and second guess that, let's harness this moment and let's use this as an opportunity to start really doing the work. And, and when I think about the work, I think about it at three levels. There's an individual level where we need to be reading books and watching podcasts and, and, and watching videos and really looking in the mirror to understand our own role in perpetuating enjoying the benefits of you know the the systemic racism that racism that's been in our country for hundreds of years there's a company level where we need to be looking at our own company practices and policies our cultures to say why you know how can we be better how can we be more welcoming how can we make this an open or you know open the doors wider to a broader swath of people and then i think there's an industry level where we need to be looking at that across across the whole country and looking at what is it about solar? What is it about the messaging that we put forward into the world that attracts people to us? And how do we change that so that it's more, again, welcoming and inclusive of other people? So that's why it's all important to me. And that's where I think we have so much work still to do. But it's exciting to be doing our little part, you know, within the amicus community to, to try to help individuals, companies in the industry, uh, come along on this journey. Well, I, I love the way you frame that and you've given me a lot to work with here as I kind of scratch my head and think about how we can delve deeper. Um, I want to go back to where you, you kind of said there's a, there's employment, which is a big part of, you know, my focus here is, is the emerging, uh, you know, growth of people of color, people of diverse backgrounds, economic, different abilities. Um, and then the other piece, though, is deployment. Um, you know, getting the solar customer base to be more inclusive. And, um, you know, do you see anything being done well out there that could be highlighted or amplified or replicated? Um, best practices? Because I know that you know, some some utility groups, the Edison Institute has identified this as a wedge issue a while back and have, you know, some of the anti-solar campaigns have really tried to pit uh, black folks against white folks, uh, poor folks against non-poor folks and define solar as an elite, you know, something for, you know, white folks with a Tesla in the driveway. And of course, the statistics are changing quickly. We know that that's just not true. But you're pointing out that there's a lot left to do to really make solar for all, including solar on the roof of, of uh, a variety of folks. What's, uh, what, what could we be doing mm -hmm. better there? I think that there are, there are a lot of groups out there doing great work. And they're, um, you know, I, I can think of, well, we'll edit this part out because I have to formulate my thought here. Uh, I think that employment and deployment are tied together because I can't imagine having successful campaigns to deploy solar into communities of color without, you know, with a purely white workforce or, and, and mm. I think it's an overstatement to say mm -hmm. that our, the solar workforce is purely white. Um, I actually, before our, our podcast, I was looking up the most recent statistics on, um, the Solar Foundation census data, which is from 2019, and how it compared to the U.S. population demographic breakdown. And in fact, it's not, it's not completely terrible. Like we're not disproportionately off in, in crazy numbers in every category. Although I do still think that we should, we should strive to be a leader in making sure that those benefits are, are better distributed. But I think a lot of this comes down to how companies approach their hiring. And when we look at where in the industry are workers of color, are, are women, where are they plugging in? 
I think a lot of times it's still in more of the entry level type jobs. And we need to see more efforts to distribute that employment through the sales and marketing departments because the messaging that's going to reach a community is not going to be the same message that's going to reach a white community. Like the, the, the problems and the mm-hmm. things that we care about, there's a lot of overlap there, but it's maybe not a hundred percent. And maybe there's, that's a part of what's been somewhat alienating to both employees and to customers is that the messaging coming from a largely white, you know, sales and marketing machine isn't speaking to them. And so like, let's, let's make sure that we are encouraging new voices to come into the messaging machine. Cause that is after all in our, in our day and age where everything is, is marketed through social media, through, you know, through all these digital fashions, like it's, it's, if it's purely coming from one perspective, we're going to miss something. And so I, I see a lot of opportunity there. I think this also extends though, into the leadership of our companies onto the boards of directors of solar companies where we still aren't seeing as much diversity as we may see at those entry levels. So it's really important that we apply these efforts at all levels of our companies and not just in hiring installers, because as important as that is, as an important as it is to create a succession plan and a pathway through our companies for people to start entry level and then rise from there. If we wait for that to unfold, I think we'll be we'll be waiting too long. I agree. We can't afford to wait. And so what I'm hearing is that deployment is tied to employment and uh, the sales and marketing efforts uh, to really reach and be more inclusive should tap into the more inclusive experience of a more diverse team. There's so much work to do. Um, what what uh, is there anybody that you want to call out in terms of uh, success or leading the charge in your organizations that are, you know, being brave and and taking some risks uh, as they as they move forwards here and learning from it and sharing that. You know, I do think there it's worth calling out some some of the industry efforts that we're seeing today. Um, there have been groups like uh, Grid Alternatives. You know, Grid was formed in I think two thousand four. And they have been at the forefront of training and deploying solar onto low and middle income housing for a really long time. I think they've ruffled feathers along the way, but I also believe that the core of their mission is fantastic. And they've been at this work a lot longer than a lot of us. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to get grid on the show. In fact, one of our third son's best project managers, um, Sadly, she had to move back to the West Coast, but she came from grid before us and brought a lot of incredible skills. Yeah. And, you know, grid has also had a really active effort in reaching out to tribes you know, across the country. There are more recent industry coalitions forming right now, like Renewables Forward, which it started out as, you know, a handful, eight or 10 pretty big names in solar getting together and saying, we need to do better. And it's got, I think at this point, something close to 50 member companies that are just coming together to say, we need to work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. They've got a bunch of different, you know, ways in which they're starting to craft their efforts. And it's been really encouraging to see that coming, you know, organically just coming up out of the, the interest and commitment of a handful of CEOs We've got the Solar Foundation has been doing important work with the surveys and the census for many years, without which we wouldn't know the demographics of the solar workforce. Um, The Women in Renewable Industries and Sustainable Energy has been a very effective voice advocating for more women in renewable, uh, in all forms of renewable energy, not just solar. Um, you know, there's there's companies within the the Amicus Cooperative Networks that I think are doing fantastic work in these regions, like Solar States in Philadelphia, and IPS up in Minnesota. You know, there's there's a Solar Energy International, which is a fantastic training organization that 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 kind of sits at that crossroads of the diversity efforts and the success 
of that, which is that you can't just hire a whole bunch of new entrants into the industry and throw them into jobs without giving them the tools to be successful. So I see training as a really important part of what we need in order to ensure that that success doesn't stop at we hired this many new people into our industry. Rather, I want to see us define success as we hired this many new people in our industry and they're still here a year later or five years later, or yeah. they've gone on to, to rise in the ranks, you know, right. five years. Right. Later. Yeah. We're, we're digging into this in another conversation, um, a broader conversation about code switching and becoming aware of what is a welcoming work environment. And again, the, the, I don't know what the word is, blindness to it of many of us, um, to, of course, we're welcoming. Well, maybe not so much if you really dig into it and want to really look hard. Um, I think of all the the different groups that are underrepresented within our industry, um, women are, you know, there's still tons of room to improve, but I'd say that women or white women, primarily white, straight, cisgendered women, if we want to get really specific, are, are doing the best or are making the most progress, um, but there's still room to improve there. Do you have any thoughts on, on just gender in the space? Yeah. So what's interesting when I was just like getting freshly brushed up on my statistics here, currently women make up 26% of the solar workforce, but women represent about half of the actual population, right? The, the numbers are 50, 51% women. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Whereas when you look at the racial demographics, we're off by one to 4% from, from what the U S demographics are. So uh, Latino and Hispanic workers are about 17% of solar, whereas they're 18 and a half percent of the U S population in 2019, Asian workers, 9% in solar 5.6% in the U S population, black or African American workers are 8% of the solar workforce and 12.2% of the U.S. population. So while those numbers are off and we still have work to do, women are off by a far larger margin. And I think that if you further dive into where women plug into the solar industry, it's in a lot of administrative jobs. It's not so much in the technical side. And, you know, there is a a somewhat natural barrier to uh, having women in the field it's hard work. It's very physical work and it isn't work that appeals to all women. And so I, I do see, you know, I think if if we looked at the construction industry as a probably fairly analogous industry, there's, there's not a ton of women electricians and plumbers and HVAC workers either. Um, So that's, that's not altogether unsurprising, but I do still see so much room for improvement in getting women into more technical roles. You know, there are lots of women coming out of engineering schools and who have full capacity to take on more of the design and more of the project management, you know, and so there's, there is actually still quite a lot of work for us to do in that regard. And, you know, it's being a part of organizations like Rise and, and watching some of the other, um, you know, women scientists and women engineers and, and, uh, the whole like, STEM STEM area. The STEM movement is is a really fantastic and exciting space. Solar industry needs to catch up in hiring yeah, into those yeah. roles uh, more aggressively. Well, I guess I'll go ahead and thank you for uh, give for educating me um, and calling me out on basically being incorrect. You know, on, on the one hand, my quick, uninformed look says, "Oh yeah, I know a lot of women in solar." But then comparing it to the national population the way you just did, uh, that really breaks it down. Um, we're going to get those stats and put them in the show notes, Amanda. That's really helpful for, for our listeners. Um, and, you know, again, we've got women, you know, in a lots of different roles, but they are clearly underrepresented out on the rooftops and in the trenches and probably on the engineering side and the more technical side. Um and uh, I do know that there's lots of people doing that kind of work. And, and as role models are out there uh, for young women and girls as they're coming up to say, oh, I could be a solar tech. 
um, I think that's, you know, nowhere to go, but up. I totally agree. And I think this is a part of the long view that we need to be taking as an industry, that we need to start this type of outreach and education and generating excitement and interest in the schools, right? Let's start in elementary school. Let's start in middle school. You know, I've read statistics that say it's a lot of girls determine their general trajectory in life and they're, they're, are forming the building blocks of their self-identity by middle school. So starting in high school, you may be too late. And I think that, you know, part of that is connected to the general effort to make skilled trades a viable alternative option to college. There's, there are some excellent organizations out there really pushing this right now. And I do also see this as part of the new administration's agenda. If you were in the room with with the, the new administration and could suggest some policy initiatives focusing on this issue of more inclusion and encouraging more solar adoption. Uh, what kinds of ideas might you might you throw out there on the whiteboard? Oh boy. Well, first can I just say I have been really impressed in the first two months of this administration and watching them build climate change into every aspect of what they're doing. It's not just relegated to the quote unquote climate czar or climate roles. I I think that what I've heard and read is that they're infusing it really into everything. And that's a part of, you know, transportation. It's a part of, um, you know, housing and urban development. It's a, it's, as it should be. Climate change is not one issue. It is a huge umbrella issue. The fact that we have in the energy department, a U.S. Deputy Secretary of Climate Justice is so phenomenal to me that that position exists and is being filled by someone who is going to do such great things. Like, this is an era that we've never witnessed. I've never witnessed in in my adult life. When that was named, I, it does shine a light that, okay, uh, it's more than just a campaign slogan tactic. Now that they've won the election, this administration is actually making the moves towards enacting a lot of the bold, move, bold talk that they had during the campaign. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. I'm just... You know, I feel like the, there, there's a lot going right right now. And mm-hmm. of course, it's very early days. So, you know, it's all still in the category of promise as opposed to, you know, accomplishments. But I'm very encouraged. I, I would say that in terms of the policies and where I would hope to see the administration direct funding, because, you know, sh- if you want to show me what you care about, show me where you put your money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's... I would say it, we need to be putting it into workforce development and trainings. I think that that's going to be one of the most important ways we affect a just transition. And that extends to workers that are coming out of fossil fuel industries that are dying and making sure that they have gainful employment. Because I, I don't think that you can effectively shift an economy, shift an energy sector, shift a utility sector away from what it knew and what has been built on for hundreds of years without giving them a way to be excited and to profit and benefit from the new way. If people only feel that you're taking something away and you're not giving them something to replace it, that's as good or better and shiny and fun, you will fail because the cultural roots that we are trying to shift run deep. And I, you know, Mm. you know this far better than I do, Jeff, living in in Ohio and in coal country. Like there's, you just, you can't simply like uproot somebody from their jobs and expect them to be happy about the new direction if you haven't given them a reason to be. So I feel like putting a lot more emphasis on transitional employment and bringing in folks from lots of other areas that are in decline is going to be another huge part of the success of this. And, and frankly, in reaching out to anybody that's affected, and that includes utilities, you know, we've struggled for many years. Solar is such a disruptive technology to the conventional utility model that they fight it, right? 
They don't like solar because it's intermittent. You can't turn it off and on. It's on people's houses. They don't get to control it. Like there's a lot of reasons why it's understandable that the fossil fuel industry and the utility industry don't like renewables. So it's it's a part of the whole shift that we still need to to take place to show them ways to be excited and welcoming of this new direction and give them ways to benefit from it. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely an entire I mean being in solar every year feels like an inflection point, but then the next year is more of an inflection point, and we are certainly at one. Um, and it's going to be interesting to watch this. This is the uh, Solar for All Better Together section of the show, um, uh, freely borrowing the Better Together theme from uh, a bunch of good organizations, including Amicus. Um, but uh, part one of this is note and promote. This is a time when you can suggest a book, author, or thought leader that you really have benefited from and that you want to shine a bright light on and uh, want to give a call out to? Any, any Anyone jump to mind? Yes. I just this week finished reading Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. And you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of reading over the last year. This was one of the most challenging books for me. Um, but also one of the most enlightening and I, I, her, her writing, first of all, is beautiful and her content is, it's hard to face, but it's also really important to face. And I think as we are struggling to understand the history of systemic racism, this, the lens that she cast at the risk of overusing the word cast, um, the, but the light that she shines onto this topic is, is a really unique angle. And um, I just found it to be a really, really compelling book. The other one, if I could go ahead and use two, is uh, So You Want to Talk About Race by uh, Ijeoma Oluo. I found that to be one of the most um, accessible books in terms of breaking down like modern cultural disconnects and Un, in unpacking the issues that are that are at play today, she doesn't go into as much history as Elizabeth Wilkerson does. But man, it it was just a really accessible and really valuable book um, in terms of shaping how I think about some of the topics that we're facing. So, super, thanks. We'll uh, yeah. we'll add them both to our show notes, and hopefully, our readers will benefit from those. Um, you got me curious as well. Um, is there uh, any advice that you've gotten from anybody in your life, any mentors, anything you want to bring out there and put out into the world? One of the best pieces of advice I ever got is ask more questions. Rather than stating something as a fact, even if you know it as a fact, asking it as a question to the person that you're talking to can give them an opportunity to share what they know and possibly add to what you know. And asking questions never makes you look dumb, especially if you're asking smart questions. Um, but that it, I think that there was probably a point in my career where I was a little too full of myself and thought I knew everything. And I, I made a few too many declarative statements than I should have. And so the, the advice to ask more questions is one that I've taken uh, to heart and tried to learn how to reframe a lot of my approach in working with folks is just to, to let them show me their expertise and in so doing, learn something new myself. Uh, not only do you have uh, good advice, but also some great self-awareness, Amanda. I think uh, I could benefit <laughs> from that wisdom. Um, well, it was imposed <laughs> upon me as opposed <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. It's good. It's good. If we're if we're not vulnerable, we're not going to grow and improve. Um, super. Well, you know, the third part here is uh, for me, music helps me get through the tough times and uh, connect with others. Um, so this is our uh, Better Together One Plus One playlist. So uh, we're asking for you to share um, an a classic, a, a go-to, a, an all-time fave, as well as something new that you're listening to. My all-time favorite song uh, is is a nod to my husband. We are celebrating our 17th wedding anniversary on April 17th, so it's our our golden anniversary. And our song is "Stay Forever" 
by Ween. It's Ween is an interesting <laughs> band because their uh, their catalog ranges from country to noise. Uh, so, and this is like their one legitimate romantic song. So I I love it. It it warms my heart. We played this in our wedding. So Stay Forever by Ween. And then the the newer artist that I have been listening to that has completely different genre uh, popped up on one of these streaming platforms that I had I had never heard of him before is Ludovico Einaudi. He's a pianist and plays modern classical music, and it is just unearthly beautiful. And I turn to that when I need to calm my mind, or kind of just you know give me pause and create some space. I can listen to it when I'm working because it's instrumental and uh, the playing is just so beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and, and thanks so much for being a guest on the show. This has been a super session here. And um, also thank you for all the work you're doing both for the earth and solar and also for the movement uh, as we look to, to take it up a notch and improve. Um, and thanks to our uh, sponsor, Third Sun Solar, and to our listeners. Um, if you want to uh, help spread the word and join us in the movement, share this with a friend. Find all the information about Amanda and all the stats that she brought up on our show notes at solarforall.show. And remember that if we're going to be successful in the fight against climate change, we're going to need everyone on the team. Uh, you have a role in this, and you can be the change you want to be in this world. And uh, remember, we are the people that we've been waiting for. Thanks again, Amanda. Thank you, Jeff. And thanks for starting this podcast. I think it's going to bring a lot to the conversation and hopefully you can shine light on a lot of great work happening in the industry. <laughs>